Checkpoint, we are so glad that you have joined us online. My name is Amber, I'm the Communications Director here at LifePoint, and we're just so glad that you're here. If you're not joining us through the app, we would love for you to connect with us there. You can get that through any app store, so if you have a iPhone, an Android, an iPad, whatever you use to join us, you can get that app through it. So it is the Church Center app when you're searching for it, and then all you gotta do is search for LifePoint when you go in there, and you'll be plugged in with all things that are happening here. Our app is a great resource for you. You can join online, and that's where we'd love to see you. You can take your next step, you can join a group, you can see what's coming up, and you can give. LifePoint, we're so thankful for your generosity. Because you give, we're able to do so many things, but there's just a quick and easy button on that app and it'll take you to our secure Rebel gift site where you can either give a one-time donation or a reoccurring gift. So thank you for that. We'd also love for you to be inviting people to join us online. You can really join online from anywhere. It doesn't even have to be a friend close to you. So if you're wanting some family friends to join you on a Sunday morning or even during the week, that's totally possible. So you can send them the app and they can join us there too. So we're really excited that you are here and joining us online. We hope you enjoy this message. Occasionally, we like to throw around a bumper video to make sure you're awake, and so that is your wake-up call today. Uh, I'm one of those people who really enjoys listening to music loud in the morning, so apologies to my neighbors and everybody else. Hey, if you haven't met, my name is Kyle. I'm the lead pastor here, <clears throat> and uh, if we haven't connected yet, <clears throat> wanted to provide a couple other ways to connect. Uh, you got my social media up here, website where I, where I write some stuff, but most of the reason I put that up there is that when if you've ever tried to email me, you realize I take way too long uh, to get back to you, and so one of the ways I connect with people easier, more more readily and probably get back to you a little bit more is on social media. And so that's one of the things that I love to connect with people over. And so if you're on Facebook or Instagram and you want to message me, or if you just want to have a conversation there, I'll probably respond to you a little bit more. Uh, email somewhere between one day and two weeks. It's a really large, depending on how many I have. So we just wanted to give you a few ways to connect. And when there's another communicator up here, we'll have their social media and stuff like that as well. And we realize there are so many people online, especially on weekends like this, because it is snowed and a lot of people stay home. That's one of the ways to connect with other people. And as communicators, we want to use as many ways as possible, articles and teaching on Sunday and YouTube videos and social media to take the gospel to as many places as possible. And so we hope that will be helpful to you. So we are in this series called 90. And 90 is kind of a series within a series within a series. Let me explain real quick. Last year, we decided to take it up upon ourselves to go through the entire Bible in a year thematically, which means we've covered just about every book and we didn't go through every line of scripture, but we did draw out the major themes in those books and created series around them. And we will finish by May of this year. And then as we approach to the early portion of this year, as we got towards the later part of last year and decided what we were going to do between January and Easter, which is very early this year, we discovered that there was 90 days between January 1st and the Saturday that Jesus was silent in the tomb. And so we decided to call this time period leading up to Easter 90. And part of the reason we did that is because we wanted people to make a conscious decision, an informed decision on whether or 
not they're going to take Jesus seriously. There were no Christians on Friday or Saturday. The only time that people had the opportunity to become a Christian was on Sunday morning when he came actually back into life. And so between January and Easter Sunday, we wanted to do a series called 90. And so we broke it up between three months about taking Jesus seriously and who he was. And today we're going to talk about this, that Jesus is the answer to our deepest longings. Jesus is the answer to our deepest longings. Now, this is a 90-day series. We've invited people to say, spend 90 days with us talking, praying, and listening to what Jesus had to say. My, our hope for you was every day you pray to him, and then as you come on Sundays and then you're in a group, or you go to one of our events, that you're thinking about him. And each, the reason it's called 90 is because over those three months, we've asked ourselves several different questions. In January, we asked, what did people say about Jesus? Because everyone has an opinion on him, not just in the first century, where some people called him uh, a lunatic, that he did not know what he was doing. He was out of his mind. Some people called him Lord, and some people called him a liar, or basically said, what you're saying about your relationship with God is not true. And that carries on to today. Lots of people have an opinion about who Jesus is, what makes him distinct from everybody else. And then month two in February, last month, <clears throat> we looked at what Jesus said about himself. And so if I were to come up to you and say, tell me about yourself, you would probably be the most foremost authority on you. You would tell me things that I wouldn't know because you've lived your life, you've experienced things, and you would describe yourself in certain ways. So we looked at the titles that Jesus gave himself. And then in this third month, March, leading up to March, uh, leading up to Easter, we want to ask this question. What answers does only Jesus provide? And you know this, but Christianity is not the only religion. It's not the only world religion. It's not the only philosophy of life. It's not the only way to have a worldview. What makes Jesus unique? You know, if you're a Buddhist, you might say <clears throat> uh, the Buddha was the place or the person to give you enlightenment and the, the answer to the things in your life. If you are a Muslim, you would say the prophet Muhammad gave <clears throat> these texts that, that told us about God, the one true God. If you're a Mormon, you might say that Joseph Smith was a person who is um, out on the forefront and you might look at their sacred text. If you're a non-Christian, you might be an atheist or an agnostic and you might look more towards philosophies or ways of life. Maybe you follow Aristotle or Plato, or maybe you follow no one, and Christianity is maybe an invasion into the world in which you know, and you want to set Jesus and his uh, ways of doing things aside. <clears throat> but the thing that none of us can get away from is all of the people that I have named, Jesus is by far the most compelling and captivating, and he's had the most impact on our world today. And you can get that from everything from your birthday. You know, the world's calendar and timing uh, of way we measure time is centered around Jesus's birth. Now, it is off by three years, and we can talk about that a different way. Someone did bad math. They probably went to Bible college. But you, what we can understand is that Jesus has influenced us. The world over gathers one time a year to celebrate a thing called Christmas, which has a title for him in its name. So you can't get away from the fact that Jesus has impacted time and space and your life <clears throat> to a degree that no other religious person has. So we need to take him seriously. So what we want to talk about today is how answers, <clears throat> how Jesus provides the biggest answers to our deepest longings. <clears throat> now, if you're a human being and you're alive, which I assume you are listening to this, sitting in this room, when you... <clears throat> got to a place where you got to examine your life, my guess is you have asked some version of the four questions I'm about to put up there. And in some way, shape, or form, these seem like the most important questions in life. And they're classic questions. I did not make them up. They've been around for a long time, but I want to reintroduce you to them. <clears throat> the first one is origin. And maybe you've discovered it this way. You've just said, where did I come from? And there are lots of ways to talk about this. So if you're an agnostic or an atheist, you may believe, or maybe if you're a Christian, as well, you may believe in something called macroeconomics, that there's not only a variation of species, but a person came from chimpanzees. And you may believe, and your worldview may consist, that the way that you became a human or the way that we became humans is because of the evolutionary process. <clears throat> That's a way to talk about. 
There are some people who believe that aliens came to this planet and they, you know, inseminated something here or they dropped off a pod or something like that. And what's ironic about that is it just pushes past the problems because then you got to ask, well, who created the aliens, right? So that's another way. How did we get here? Some people believe that we just rose out of primordial ooze. Some people, myself included, believe that there is a God of the universe who created us from nothing and that science seems to back that up is that God created us and when there was no time, no space, and no matter, a sentient being known as God said, I will make my masterpiece in human beings. But at some point, most people ask this question, how do I get here beyond your mother and father? Number two is meaning. What is the purpose of my life? I very rarely, if almost never, maybe one or two people who don't really care for the long term what happens to them or how they make an impact on life. Most people want to know, why am I here? Why am I the way that I am? Why do I have the genetics that I do? Why do I have the desires that I do? Why do I want to do things? Why do I not want to do other things? Most people want to know that their life has a purpose. Is it to be a good parent? Is it to follow a God? Is it to do something with your life, if you've given a pivotal circumstance or something in your life, what do I do with my life? Almost everyone wants to know that if someone walked up to you, you would have an answer to, I am on this world for X, Y, or Z. <clears throat> Number three is a bit of an interesting one. Number three is, how should I treat people? It's morality. Now, not everyone asks this question. Most people were just like, I just want people to treat me good. And every once in a while, I get to have like a philosophical, theological worldview question with people. And it always is very, very fascinating to me, especially in certain parts of the United States. When I talk with people and I ask them, is there right or wrong? And sometimes people say no. And I go, well, what happens if I slap you in the face right now? Is that right or is that wrong? It's definitely painful. But sometimes I'll ask people, I said, hey, if I were to steal your wallet from you, would that be good? Would that be right or they're, they're wrong? And either way, they've lost. Because if they say no, then I go, well, give me your wallet, <laughs> right? And if they say yes, I go, well, how do you get to this place where you know that something is right or wrong? How do you know that there's a person or a being out there or a, a reason for you to have right and wrong? So morality, how do I treat others? How do I treat myself? And then the fourth one is often the most interesting to people. What happens to me after I die? Do, do I just cease to exist? Do I go into this darkness and I have no consciousness and I'm not aware of anything in life? Do I just become a part of the universe like some religions teach? Do I go to a place that's not exactly good? Or as maybe as Christianity teaches, do I go to a place to be with God forever? This last question is part of the reason I became a Christian, is that as I watched some people who were around me who I loved and cared about, and their life ended, I wondered, did it really end? Was there somewhere that they went to? And I wanted this hope to be able to see <clears throat> them again. Now, if you were to take these four questions you would probably think these are the most important questions of all time. They're not. They are super important. And most of people, most people who have ever lived have asked one, if not all of these questions. And if you had the answers to these questions, your life would fundamentally change, especially the first one. If you believe that you just came to being because of chance, then maybe you don't have a purpose in your life. But if you believe that the God of the universe created you, then you do have a purpose. It would change everything else. But my guess is the average person who lives every day, who is a parent, who is a child, who is a college student, who is married, who is single, they have something deeper. <clears throat> and the one I want to talk about today is your deepest longings. And I've not met all of you. I don't know all of you personally, and I don't know all of you online. But my guess is the following statement is true. Every person has two longings above all else. And it's not the answer to those questions. Those are important, but they're not the biggest. I believe that every person has two longings. We all have a longing to be known for something and to be loved by someone. To be known for something and to be loved by someone. Now, your answer to this may be a little bit different. I'm just going to give you a few for me. You know, as a, a person who is married, and I know some of you are shocked by that, who would put up with you for a length of time, but that's why I believe in God. I'm married way up. So as a husband, I want to be known as a person who loves and cares about Rachel, my wife. 
that I support her and care for her and lift her up towards Christ with all of my being. As a parent, I've got two kids, London and Emma. Most of the time I like them, depends on the day, but they're pretty awesome. And I want to be known as a dad who propels them towards Christ, who lifts them up, who sacrifices for them, who provides for them, who loves and cares for them more than anything else. And then as a pastor, (laughs) there are some things I'd like to be known for as well. I like to be known as a person who gave the gospel, who wasn't a person who softened the sharp edges of the things that Jesus said. There are things that I don't want to be known for, right? I don't want to be known as a person who watered down the gospel or made it easy on people. But I do want to be a person who encourages. And at the end of my life, that someone said, you know what? I know Jesus because of him. And maybe you have some different ones. And I also want to be loved by all those people. I want to be loved by my spouse and my kids and my church and my volunteers and my staff. And also ultimately by God. I want to be known and loved by God. Now, Tim Keller has this great quote, and uh, I'm such a fan of his, not only because of his theological mind, but the way he has uh, this talent of describing things. And I realize he passed on, but I do believe he's alive somewhere, and we'll get to see him again someday. So hopefully, he likes it when I quote him. So it says this, to be loved but not known is comforting but superficial. And to be known and and not loved is our greatest fear. But to be fully known and truly loved is, well, a lot like being loved by God. It is what we need more than anything else. It liberates us from pretense, and it humbles us out of our self-righteousness, and it fortifies us for any difficulty that life can throw at us. And that's a great way of thinking about it. Here's just a way of kind of summarizing what he just said. You know, to be known and to be loved is helpful but superficial. And to be loved and not known is comforting, but not relational. Let me give you a few examples of these. So if someone knows you, I know some of you really well. Some of you are my neighbors. Some of you are my friends. Some of you are just acquaintances. I don't have the capacity, and no human being does, to know everyone really well that they come across. We have a cap as the people who we can allow into our lives. So some of you I know a little bit. Some of my neighbors I wave to. Some of them I've helped them rebuild a fence. Some of them I know their kids and their people really, really well. But I don't necessarily love all of them to a degree that I would love my family, my kids, and everyone else. It's superficial to some degree, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Again, we all have a capacity for that. So to be known can be helpful, but it's superficial. I may not do something to someone I know superficially or for someone that I would do for my own kids or for some of you, for the people in my family. Now, to be loved and not known is comforting, but it's not relational. You know, imagine someone came up on a Sunday and they'd be like, hey, I really like your message. I want to let you know how much I love you, Kevin. I was like, that's not my name. <laughs> my name is not Kevin. My name is Kyle. And if they walk away, they'd be like, see you next Sunday, Kevin. I'm like, gosh, you know. And if your name is Kevin... Bless to you. I'm not saying anything bad about that. But if someone claims to love me and they don't know the basics about me or the basics about you, it's not relational at all. In fact, you might deem it as fake. So you need both. And in terms of having a relationship, and we'll ultimately talk about this as a relationship with God, to know someone and love them, you need both. When you know someone, you know how to help. And when you love someone, you want to help. You need both of those. But what happens when you don't get those two fulfilled? And I promise I will get to scripture. I just want to set up our time today. You know, feeding any longing, <clears throat> feeding any longing becomes unhealthy if we feed it with the wrong thing or with the right thing in the wrong amount. Some of you are missing one of these two. You've been known but not loved. You've been loved but not known. The people who have both of these for you, there's such a great authentic relationship that you have. But some of these you have been missing for a long time. You know, I used to live in Orange County, hold the booze, and I'm from California. Sorry about that. But one of the things that was so apparent when I lived there was the fact that so many people grew up, and it's not just a California thing, but so many people grew up without the love of their parents. Some of them never knew their parents. Some of them had a father or a figure that was absent or not really kind to them. And at least the the women in my life, the people who were friends and the people who were family members, some of them went on to feed this desire to be loved with men who would never love them. And some of the men I knew had a relationship with their father that you would describe as toxic, terrible, or just absentee. And they would fill that longing with the wrong relationships. It was the wrong thing. But you can also fill something with the right thing in the wrong amount. Let me give you a few examples, just a personal one. 
You know, I am a Christian and I am a pastor. And one of the things I'm afraid of more than anything else is when my kids grow up that they will walk away from their relationship with Jesus. And so during that time, I ask them to, and sometimes compel them, to read their Bible, to pray, and to come to church. Now imagine if I did only that, like put the Legos away, we're doing a Bible study for five hours. Do you think my 13-year-old wants to do that? Probably not. But imagine I did the right thing in the wrong amount. You're not going to go outside and play. You're just going to study and you're going to pray for 13 hours. I don't even do that. You know, I, you can't give someone that my deepest longing is to have my kids have a relationship with Jesus. But if I give them that in the wrong amount, they will walk away from their faith. And there's lots of other examples for this. Imagine you want to be financially secure. And instead of giving to the church or giving to someone away, you continue just to hoard all of your resources and you never do anything with them. And you die and you don't know who it's left to. Or the opposite is you grew up with nothing and you never want to have that happen to you and your family. And the longing is for your family to have great things and you spend all of it and you never save for retirement. You need the right thing in the right amount. Which brings us to our time with Jesus today. So in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus has this, in my opinion, this conversation with Peter about these two subject matters, both knowledge and love. So in Matthew 16, we're going to look at this conversation. It's a very famous conversation, particularly for Catholics. And so if you're Catholic, you're going to recognize a portion of this. But what's happening here is that Jesus has been around with his disciples for a long time. And he gets to this place... He starts to ask them this question, do you and does society really know who I am? And he doesn't quite ask that in that way. He does ask this question, who do people say I am? And then kind of towards the end of his conversation with with Peter, he asks, do you love me enough to carry out what I'm about to tell you to do? Now, the good thing about preaching two gatherings is when I preach the first one, people give me feedback. And the feedback I got was this isn't an overly encouraging message. And I want to say it actually is, but you're going to have to stay with me to the end. Because for a little while, you may be like, oh, this is challenging. But I promise you, at the end, it will be encouraging. So Jesus has this, uh, this relationship with his disciples. He hangs out with them for somewhere between three and three and a half years. And during this time, they should have seen enough of him to know who he is and to love him him enough to carry out his wishes. But that's not always the case. So in Matthew 16, it says this, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Son of man is Jesus's favorite title for himself. Pastor Roy talked about this a couple weeks ago. It is a divinity title and it's talked about in the Old Testament. And it basically tells people who Jesus is, that he is God incarnate. And that's a message for a different time. So they replied, oh, well, if you ask around town, you take a poll to people, here is what people have said. Some people say you're John the Baptist, uh, which is awkward because John the Baptist is his cousin and they walked around together. But maybe people just assign the title of the Son of Man to John himself. Some people say Elijah, an Old Testament guy who did all these incredible things. And uh, Jesus, you've done incredible things. So people think maybe you're his reincarnation or maybe you kind of appeared in the way that Elijah did. So others, Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And so Jesus said, okay, that's, that's the public opinion. That's people who have not interacted with me as much as you guys have. You, my 12 disciples, have been around me for about three years. You've watched me. You've heard me talk. Who do you say that I am? That's what he says. But you, not the crowd, who? Who do you say that I am? Now, this is where it's really fun to, like, poke fun at Peter a little bit. Peter is that annoying guy in the class where if anybody says, hey, who knows the answer? He shoots his hands up. I know it. And everyone just wants to smack him because we're like, yeah, we get it, Peter. Like Jesus was like, who wants to walk on water? Peter's like, me, that's me. He always in the gospels is first to go, (coughs) often to his own detriment and sometimes in incredible ways. And so the other disciples are like, I'm not touching this one. This is a test. And Peter's like, I know this answer. I got this one. So Simon Peter, and we'll get to the dualnality of his names in just a second. Simon Peter answers Jesus's question. You are the Messiah, the chosen one, the son of a living God. And it's an incredible. And Jesus is like, that's the right answer. That's the answer that I'm looking for. Good job. Gold star. Peter probably pats himself on the back and Jesus is like, "Eh, I'm not really done yet. So Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. He takes him back to who he really was because Peter was renamed from Simon to Peter. And a lot of people would correlate that to the new way that Jesus is going to give him a new purpose in his life. But Jesus goes back and he says, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father 
in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. Now, Peter, the Greek, uh, Koine Greek of his name, Peter, is Petros, which assembly, uh, simply means rock. So he's kind of using this uh, play on words here. On this rock, I will build my church. So Peter, you are the rock, but honestly, I will build my church upon your rock. Now, if you are a Catholic or an ex-Catholic or a curious Catholic or whatever you want to describe yourself in terms of Catholicism, this is a very pivotal portion of your faith and the structure of the Catholic Church. Because most people believe, especially if you're a Catholic, that it is in this portion and Jesus' conversation with Peter is that they got their structure of the Catholic Church. The reason that they have a pope is because Jesus said, because of this, this position that you hold of influence, Peter, I will build my church. Now, I read this in a different way. I read this very much so as that Jesus is talking about the confession and the illuminated way that Peter, that was revealed by the Father, of who Jesus was. That the confession, that the acknowledgement that Peter says about Jesus, that's the foundation of our church, not a position. And part of the reason that's so important to me is because there is no person in the church that will ever replace the importance of Jesus Christ. Not a person, not a pastor, not a politician, not anybody. And that's foundational. It's important. So Jesus says to him, on this foundation, again, in my opinion of what Peter has said, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And most people think that uh, the gates of Hades are being held in. And Jesus is essentially saying, we're going to charge through the gates of hell with this gospel. And the gates of hell will not be able to overtake it. Satan's got no shot when it comes to me. So then from then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples. And he continues on. He basically helps them understand what this would look like. Now, everyone loves a good speech, especially a brave heart speech. We're like, we're going to take the castle. We're going to charge the hill. We're going to do this thing. Everyone loves that until it comes to the point of how that is actually going to happen. So Peter and the disciples must have been like, yes, Lord, let's charge Hades. Let's do God's work. Let's be incredible for you. Let's take over this world in your name. Let's do that. And then he said, I'm not finished. How I will do that is probably not what you're thinking. So from then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples first, the people his inner circle, that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. And next week, we're going to talk about the power of of suffering and blessing. And next week, I hope you'll show up to this because if you haven't suffered in your life, you will at some point. And at some point, you have to understand what to do with that suffering. And some of you have suffered so much in your life and you know exactly what to do. But I hope you'll come back because there's a paradox here in suffering. But we'll talk about the next week. So many things from the elders, chief priests, scribes, and to be killed and to raised on the third day. Now, this is where the apostles are and, the, and the, the people who followed him were probably like, all right, time out. I don't really want that to happen. We kind of like it that you're doing miracles. We kind of like it that you're healing people. We kind of like it that you're exercising demons. We kind of like it when you take a small bit of food and you feed all of us. That part's our favorite. We like it when you turn your water into wine. We like it when you tell the religious people off. We like all of that stuff. I don't know that we're on board for this. And we know that because Peter takes him aside. Peter takes Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke him. All sorts of red flags, right? If you are Peter and you try to take the God of the universe aside and be like, hey, Jesus, I don't know if you've read your Bible a lot, but that's not the plan. He says, look, oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Again, Peter's the first one always to come and point this out. He's like, no, Lord, I'm going to be the first, and I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to say that's terrible, and I'm going to say you shouldn't be killed, and you should live on. You've got to be our leader. That will never happen. And then Jesus turns to him and says something you should never say in any fight in any time. Get behind me, Satan. You never want another Christian to say that to you. Essentially, Jesus is saying, you're not on my side if you think this way. If you think this way. You are a hindrance to me, Jesus says to Peter, because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but about humans' concerns. And this is a big challenge here, because Peter should have known better. Because if he had read his Bible, you could see that Isaiah and Jeremiah and other people all over the place talk about how there will be a suffering servant. They will be pierced for our transgressions, that he will be tortured and ultimately killed. That was the plan beyond 
the rah-rah speech of Jesus, that's the plan. And now there comes a choice. You like the speech, you thought you know me, but do you? So then Jesus said to his disciples, and he turns this into a teaching moment, just in case everyone's not clear on this. He says, if anyone wants to follow me, if, not when, if, you have to deny yourself, you have to take up your cross. And for some people, this would be metaphorical. You and I, it's probably metaphorical or symbolic. For a person possibly like Peter, who's a lot of believe he was crucified upside down, it would be physical. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, follow me. Forever who wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. It's a totally paradoxical thing. Jesus' kingdom is completely upside down. And it was confusing. But then... But then he talks about kind of the subject matter that I'm talking about today. And I think it's the deepest longings of our souls and our hearts. He says, what if, for what benefit, <clears throat> for what benefit will someone get if he or she gains the whole world and yet loses his life? And some, some translations have soul right here. Essentially, and this is what I think Jesus is saying, what happens if you get the deepest longings of your heart? What happens if you get everything that you want in life? And yet you lose your very soul. You have nothing. I mean, Jesus is essentially talking about what do you really know and what do you really love about me? Because Peter clearly didn't know the plan. And we're not sure if he loved him enough to carry it out yet. Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? And what's interesting about this is part of the reason Jesus is challenging Peter is because Jesus sees into the future and he knows what Peter's going to do. So when Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and he is about to be arrested, Peter grabs a sword to defend Jesus. And luckily, Peter isn't really athletic, and so he swings. He cuts off a guy's ear rather than his head. But Peter is ready to go to war for Jesus to protect him. And it's the wrong move. I mean, Jesus says, do you really know what I'm here to do? And do you love me enough to carry it out? And at that time, the answer is probably no. Because when Jesus does get captured, they start to look for all of his disciples and they start to look for the people who know him because they were going to arrest him too. And they ask Peter, hey, weren't you with Jesus? Weren't you, weren't you like his right-hand guy? And Peter denies him three times, three. He didn't love him, at least at the time, enough. Or maybe he didn't have enough information. I'm not really sure. But he did not and would not carry out Jesus' plans. <clears throat> So to summarize what Jesus has said here, though, and how this matters and why this matters to you, you know, the world says this, just be yourself. And Jesus says, just deny yourself. You know, if you are a young person, you can determine what that is. I'm not going to do that. But if you are a person who wants to be authentic to who you are, authenticity is a buzzword, and I believe in authenticity, but the thing is, is that it's counterintuitive if we are trying to be ourselves, but we don't know who we are. And the reason that Jesus talks about this is because if we don't allow God to define who we are, the world will. And it's a far, far superior way of thinking about who we are when we let God define us. So Jesus says, you know, the world tells you to just be yourself, and I'm telling you to deny everything about yourself in order to follow me. The world says to live fully, and I'm telling you, to die fully. You know, this is probably a massive oversimplification, but if you were to live in this world today, essentially the world is asking you to live in three things. Money, sex, and power. If you have the right position, if you, uh, if you go through and get all of your desires in a physical man, and if you have the financial security to do whatever you want, that is a full life. It has always been. doesn't matter who's in charge. The basic three things that the world believes will give you a full life. And Jesus says, you've got to die to all that. You've got to die to all that to, to follow me. And then the third one is the worst piece of advice I've ever heard anybody ever give anyone. Is the world says, follow your heart. Anybody who tells you that, run in the other direction. And the reason for that is that scripture has said, and maybe you disagree if you're not a Christian, but maybe if you self-examined and looked inwardly at the hardest moments of your life, scripture says, out of the depths of your heart come all sorts of badness, selfishness, sexual impurity, greed, lust, murder. 
I can emphatically say yes because I've had all of those thoughts as a pastor, as a Christian. I can emphatically say yes to this because even as just I examine my own heart, I get mad at people who cut me off on the highway. I was like, you know what, I'll just, you know. That's not a good Christian thing to do. But all of us have this thing in our heart called sin that out of it flows not godly things, but terrible things. And that's why scripture tells us, do not follow your heart. You have to follow someone who is good. And Jesus says, only God is good alone. So Jesus says to follow me. So here's the challenge. Here's, here's the challenging thing. Now, if you're not a Christian, this will be hopefully helpful to you. If you are a Christian, this may be challenging to you. And I'll explain why in just a second. Jesus knows and loves you. That's the encouraging part of today's message. The challenging part is, do you really know and love him? And before you answer yes too quickly, remember, Peter walked with him for three years and didn't really know what Jesus was asking. Peter walked with him for three years and watched him as he gave fish and bread to people and watched him exercise demons and watched him as he healed dead people. And he thought he knew who he was. Peter claimed to have loved God. And at his deepest moment of need, Jesus' deepest moment of need, Peter abandoned him. That's why this question is so challenging. Because do you really know what God is asking? Hopefully I put those on the, on the, on the screen for you. God is really asking you to die to yourself and all the other things he says. And do you love him enough to carry out those things? Now, talking about being known and loved, everyone wants to be known for something and by someone. You know, your deepest longing is to be known for something. I hope that you want to be known as a follower of Jesus. Now, there are some consequences here. It's going to piss some people off. To be honest, I have lost family members and friends, coworkers, and other people because I cared more about Jesus than I cared about them. And that's so harsh to hear. But the thing I always try to tell them is it is because of my love for Jesus that fuels my love for you. And people are like, I don't believe he exists. I don't like him. I don't like that you've become that. And it has been costly. But my hope is as I live through life and maybe as you live through life, that your deepest desire to be known is that someone will look at you and say they were a great Christian. They treated me with respect and honor and kindness. And I knew them as that. And the second one is your deepest longing is to be loved by someone. Let God love you when you are unlovable. This is the other encouraging part of today's message. You know, I've been kind of harping on Peter throughout this message, but the really cool thing about what happens with Peter and Jesus is that Peter denies Christ three times. And then when Jesus comes back to life, he searches out Peter and he gives him three, he tells him, hey, do you really love me, Peter? And there's this interplay between phileo and agape and the types of love in Koine Greek. But essentially, Jesus is asking, do you really love me? And he reinstates him in his mission. Because now Peter understands the depths of why Jesus came. Oh, he had to die. And he had to suffer in order to come back. And then he has a new type of knowledge. That not, the knowledge that death is not the end, that suffering had a purpose, and that ultimately Jesus was who he said he was. The Son of God, the Messiah. He knew enough about Jesus' mission to understand what he was asking. And now he loved him enough to carry out that mission. So my hope and challenge for us is to say, do we know enough about what Jesus is actually asking us to do? Do we know that he's asking us to die to ourselves? Does he know he's asking us not to follow our hearts? Does he know he's asking us to give everything to him? And do we love him enough to carry that out, even when it will cost us something in life? We need both knowledge and love. And here's the last thing I'll say that's hopefully the most encouraging. God knows everything about you and loves you anyways. The reason that's so important, have you ever told anybody the depths of what's happening in your heart and your mind? Have you ever told anybody in your life 
some of the decisions that you've made that you wish you'd never had? Have you ever told anybody in your life all the things that you want to keep buried that you hope no one ever finds out? I've never done it. Those people would probably leave me in a heartbeat. And God already knows all of them. And he loves you anyways. That's why knowledge and love are so powerful. He has seen what you are like at your best and at your worst. And he loved you even when you did not love him. And so maybe your deepest longing to be loved should be only fulfilled by God. I'm going to pray for us in a second, and then I got one more thing, but I hope you'll come back next week. Next week, we're going to talk about this, is that Jesus is not only, as we talked about today, the solution or the the answer to our deepest longing. Next week, Jesus is the solution to our greatest suffering. I hope you never suffer greatly in your life, but some of you have and some of you will, and Jesus is the ultimate answer to that. I hope you come back for that. Let me pray for us, and then I got one more thing to tell you. Father, thankful for this. Um, Peter is so relatable. He's like us, knucklehead sometimes. Lord, we're so grateful that he has made mistakes because it helps us understand that you love people who not only make mistakes, but who sin against you. Lord, thank you for knowing the count of the hairs on our head, the depths of our soul, the evil in our hearts, and also the good we can do for you. Lord, thank you for loving us even when we haven't loved you. Lord, help us desire to know you more, to your mission, what your scripture says and what you expect from us. And Lord, I just pray that you give us the love, your son's love, that will empower us to enact your mission within our lives, in the local church and in the world. Help us know you and love you above all else to fuel everything else in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, lastly, I'll say we've discovered that some of you like baking. So please, if you do like baking, go out there and get one of those pans so you can help us cook for Easter. We would love that. And also, I really want you to think about baptisms. In two weeks, I'm going to talk about baptisms. Many of you have been baptized, but some of you, after hearing what I have to say, are actually going to want to get rebaptized because of your knowledge and love of God will be different than you probably thought it was. Thank you so much for being here. You're already blessed in Christ. Have a great Sunday. Thank you.